<sighs> December was a month for me. I suppose December is always a month, but what I mean to say is December was quite a month for me. Shall we begin? For those of you who don't know, I'm actually not a musician. I'm a mechanical engineering major over at Gonzaga University, go Zags. But this month, I think I got a taste of what the gigging life is like. I had a very musically involved December. I think that's all the preamble I can give it. I think we ought to hop in and hurry up. This is going to be a long one, so strap yourselves in and enjoy the show as much as possible. We started off with our Gonzaga Wind Symphony concert. There are two bands. The Wind Symphony is the larger of the two and the non-audition group, but if you're in the audition group, the Wind Ensemble, you kind of automatically get placed into the Wind Symphony. So it ends up being about... 80 people total. It's a loud band. Um, <laughs> and I, I definitely didn't expect too much from this concert going in. But this is one that, you know, pleasantly surprised me, I would say. Uh, we played some pretty fun rap this semester, I'll admit, especially the Armenian Dances by Alfred Reed. That is a really, really cool piece. <laughs> I had to cover some cues in this piece because of some instrumentation challenges, such as the fact that we didn't have a bassoon for the performance, and so the bassoon cues I tried to play, I kind of tripped on them a little bit, unfortunately. <laughs> What I don't think I tripped on, though, is the French horn cue that I played. There's a huge, bombastic French horn line during the last of the five sections of Armenian dances that I really loved when I was listening to it. And there was one rehearsal a few weeks before the concert where the conductor kept, just kept hassling the horn section for not putting out enough sound. And so I did what any logical euphonium player would do, and I just belted the horn line out with them <laughs> when it came. And, you know, the conductor's doing his thing, and he just kind of looks over at me with that, oh, you sly dog look on his face. So I once again did the logical thing and just kept doing that up through the concert. <laughs> The slight trouble is that while that big horn line is going on, there's also a one-only section written into the baritone part, meaning that one player is supposed to play it, kind of like a solo, and that was intended to be me, but I just passed that on to the next guy down, who was a trumpet player, he's, you know, an actual music ed major, and even though he's not a performance major, he can run circles around me on the trumpet. So, you know, I've been teaching him a little euphonium on the side, of course, because nobody else at Gonzaga will do it, and so... He got, the, he got the little solo there. I think it was a win for everybody. I got to belt out a horn line and he got his own little solo, shall we say? I also, later on in that concert, got to perform what is very much not your average euphonium solo in a Carmina Burana suite. never been called to put that kind of a sound out of a euphonium before, but I suppose there's a first for everything. I also did my fair share of cueing during the Carmina Burana, be it first horn, fourth horn, tuba. That's something I used to have to do a lot in wind ensemble last year. This year, thankfully, we've had better tubas to carry the weight, but that didn't stop me from honking a few low notes here or there. Also, our band director decided we should use beer glasses as the percussion in that ninth movement. And you know what happened? They shattered during the concert. So yeah, no matter how well or poorly we played, that is what people are going to remember from that night. Mm -hmm. 
That following Saturday, we had the concert for the GU Wind Ensemble, which is the higher of the two groups. It's smaller and doesn't have a bunch of people doubling parts, so it's a little bit of a different sound, and the group is meant to perform in a little bit of a higher caliber. The trouble with that is most of the music we are fed is very contemporary, written within the last decade, or at the very least, two decades. We open the program, though, with something in stark contrast to that in the form of Percy Granger. Now that was a really, really fun euphonium part, but like I said, it was a complete tonal clash with everything else on the program, and I get a little tired of contemporary rep sometimes, but we did get to perform a real modern masterwork in the form of Andrew Boss's Tetelestai. I don't know if I pronounced that quite right, it's Greek for It Is Finished, and this piece is a biblical tale of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ through music. It is, wow. I mean, you feel it. You feel it, for sure. I should also not neglect to mention, in the wind ensemble, I am the only euphonium. Like I said, nobody else wants to do it. And I think that's partially because modern writing for the euphonium is genuinely really, really bad. The euphonium is heavily neglected. But nonetheless, I was the only one on my instrument just trying to power through. For reference, there were more Barry saxes in the wind ensemble than me. That, <laughs> that just shouldn't be the case. A wind ensemble needs one Barry sax and two to three euphoniums. But there was one of me, and I, I really had to work on projecting my sound. That was a concert that I went into with slightly higher expectations, which was a mistake. I would say in general, for performances, keep your expectations relatively low. I just kind of got set up, because the Wind Symphony concert felt like it went a lot better than my expectations. <laughs> On Monday night, directly following that, I had the GU Symphony concert. Now, I'd never played in the orchestra up to this point. It's a kind of a half-student, half-community ensemble. And there's really a wide array of players in this ensemble. And I always kind of figured, like, oh, while I'm at GU, you know, I'm kind of burned out from doing five years of youth symphony. I'm just going to stick to band stuff. Well, I got called to play bass trombone, of all things, in the orchestra, and I found that I kind of scratched my itch a little bit. I kind of keep gravitating back towards the orchestra, funnily enough. Uh, that was my first performance on bass trombone, and I'll have to say the first couple rehearsals were kind of rough. I really had to get my bearings in a way that I didn't expect, just because I play a fair amount of tenor trombone, and it feels like it shouldn't be that big of a switch to bass, but it definitely is. <laughs> this was a challenge, but nonetheless a very fun one. We played some pretty cool rep. <laughs> Thank you. 
We also accompanied the one and only Shlomo Mintz on the Sibelius Violin Concerto, uh, and while my part for that was very boring, it was still quite an inspiring sort of thing to be a part of, because, you know, it's not every day you play the Shlomo Mintz. I also had a very proud moment after this concert that just tickled me a little bit. My friend who plays tuba in the GU bands was in the audience. He's a freshman, just came in, absolutely monstrous sound. Uh, my first impression of him was sitting right in front of him in wind ensemble and running through a rather loud passage and just looking back and going, this dude could overpower the entire band if he so much as lifted a finger. He plays loudly. He comes up to me after the orchestra concert and he goes, Sam, you were so loud. I don't know how you get that much sound out of a trombone. I was right in front of your bell and you were all I could hear. <laughs> that, that made me really happy because I was really struggling to get what felt like an appropriate amount of volume out of the bass trombone for my first few rehearsals. I think something clicked just before the concert and I, I was finally able to harness it a little bit more. Don't worry though, at a later gig this month I ran into and was talking to the music director at Westminster UCC for whom I've played a number of gigs and he brought up that he had actually gone to that concert and heard my little bass trombone debut and while he said he could certainly hear me he said it was perfect volume and tasteful so I'm I'm very glad that it wasn't overdone although I, I can't say for certain. <laughs> My chops feel funny just thinking about this day. December 10th, 2022 was one of the most musically involved days of my life. For starters, you know, I started the day off with a casual tuba Christmas. Oh, you know, several hours of euphonium playing, a lot of it in the upper register because I was on first euphonium for that. Oh yeah, no big deal. <laughs> I handled it better than the last time I did it, which was in 2019. You know, I paced myself a little bit better and had the endurance to last better than last time, because last time I fully expected to play second euphonium, and then the director at Westminster who was conducting, he said, no, 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 let's bump him up to first, which was at the time a mistake. Now this year I was able to handle it a little bit better, but nonetheless, I was just slightly tired after that first gig, we'll say. <sighs> Actually, not, not too bad, not too bad. Could be worse. The lovely thing about today is we are just getting started. This is gig one of three today, so now I gotta run. So yeah, I get home and I unwind for about half an hour and then part two of the day rolls around. Okay, gig two out of three. It's just past four. We're on our way to a brewery for a brass quintet gig. So can't wait to play for some drunk people. I've got my triple stand from Hercules here. So I gotta play cornet, trumpet, and flugelhorn for this. Should be fun. I'm feeling a little tired from playing euphonium for several hours today, but let's go and seize the evening and, and entertain some drunk people. Okay, 
Can you set the ready? I treated this gig as an excuse to use my newest cornet, of which I have, you know, too many uh, in general. But this is an old Yamaha 334, which, as you can see, doesn't have a shepherd's crook. And so my rationale was, oh, when we're playing cornets, um, Alex and I, in the quintet, it's going to be a fairly bright sound compared to, you know, the British brass band cornet. So I'll use this thing. It's probably a little bit of a brighter sound, right? It's a less overtly British design. More on that later. This was a really fun quintet to play with. I, I enjoy quintet stuff in general, but this is one of the better quintets I've probably played with. It's all people from the Spokane British Brass Band, so all people I knew and already enjoyed playing with. And honestly, I, I think we did a decent job. We had some cool quintet rep in there. We had some quartet stuff arranged by Alex, who played a couple of instruments. He played the little E-flat uh, alto or tenor horn, and he also played some cornet on these these quintet gigs. And what we'd do on those quartet tunes is Dave and I, the other formal trumpet player, would kind of trade off a little bit, and the quartet stuff would give us an excuse to sometimes lay out, only one of us would need to play at any given point. I'd add some stuff while he was playing, but that was just, you know, me being me. Um, what was cool was we had tunes we'd do three times, so maybe the first and third times the other four besides me would play. And then on the middle time, uh, Alex and I would have a little interlude between, you know, something like the cornet and the horn. <laughs> Okay, gig two done. 
started off great. I was feeling awesome. About half an hour in, I really start to feel it around here, especially because Brass Quintet, you know, it's constantly on the face pretty much. So yeah, about half an hour in, it starts getting like, whoa, now we're off to do more playing and I'm already chopped out more or less. So <laughs> gig three of three, let's, let's go. I got to run. Gonzaga has this yearly tradition of a really big concert for pretty much the entire choral program. And it's, you know, a pretty big thing. They call it the Candlelight Christmas Concert because the choir goes on stage with candles and it's dark and the, you know, one piece transitions seamlessly into the next and you have people walking on and off stage all the time. You have the dance team brought in and there's usually a brass quintet as part of the gig and a fair amount of percussion behind them. And I got called to be in that, along with quite a number of other students, uh, people I play with in the GU brass quintet, which unfortunately did not do any holiday themed stuff. But I got to the gig and I realized none of the other students had said yes to this. And I was instead playing with four professional or semi pros in the area. And I was like, oh, okay, I, I guess I'm kind of the outlier here. What was nice about gig number two was besides the shirt, I already had the outfit prepared, so nice quick change and we're ready to go. I have hardly ever been more thankful to play second trumpet. Holy smokes, I could not do first right now. Let's do it! <laughs> Remind me not to do that again anytime soon. That was too many hours of playing for one day. I can still feel it just a little bit right here. And that, at long last, put a bow on a very, very long musical day. It was a fun gig overall. I, Like I said, I was thankful to play second trumpet because I was tired out, but it was nice to be able to hear the candlelight concert going on. In fact, from kind of an interesting perspective from backstage. <laughs> Sunday was, for the most part, put to use studying for finals because I had a really rough round of them coming up. You know, your fifth semester as a mechanical engineer is an interesting one. But I did have one gig, and it was just a repeat of the Candlelight concert. The Sunday afternoon show was a little bit more relaxed for me because I wasn't immediately coming off of several more hours of playing. I think the GU choral program is probably the strongest aspect of our music department. I mean, they, they put on a really good show. All of our choirs are really strong, so very, very enjoyable all around. I really enjoy the Candlelight concert. I attended last year and had a really great time. And when I got, you know, hired to play for this one, I was like, well, it saves me the cost of the ticket and I get to be part of the show. Sounds like a good deal to me. Now this wasn't a gig, but I thought I should throw in the fact that right after being done with finals on Thursday evening, a couple hours later I was at another university and I was rehearsing for one of the upcoming gigs. Uh, but it was a really nice way to unwind and I definitely felt a little better about playing music now that the finals were done and out of the way.
I was not the first choice for this gig, I was a ringer, but the original first choice was my friend Logan, whom I've mentioned a couple times on the channel. He went to this university a few years back, then went and got his master's across the country, then came back and is now teaching trumpet at this university. It's crazy how quickly things change. But this would have been his gig, uh, he couldn't do it, so he pawned it off onto me. And what that gave me the opportunity to do was draft a second trumpet player of my choosing. So I went with my friend Jay from the brass band, whom I usually sit next to, but more on that later. Usually we sit at the in the uh, third and fourth seats of the front row of the cornet section, and he's just a really wonderful player. So I, I decided I'd, uh, I'd take another chance to play next to him. <laughs> All right, Lilac Brass is performing again today. Uh, this venue is a little bit more of a commute, but it's a, you know, an assisted living center, and uh, we're gonna be making some more music as before. Got my Christmas sweater back on. I've got all three horns with me. I think we're ready to do this.
Honestly, another really fun gig. We played in a fairly large hall, or what I thought was fairly large, but they packed it pretty full of people. And everybody was really delighted that we'd come to play. And they were very, very receptive. We had a couple of requests for carols that thankfully we did have on the set list. We just didn't quite get through everything because we were actually on a fairly limited scale of time. You know, an hour actually turned out not to be nearly enough to get through our program. But in any case, I had a really great time at this one. Yeah, hard to believe it's already the 18th of December, but today I have two more gigs after a fairly busy day yesterday. Um, one of them is the Spokane British Brass Band gig this afternoon, which I've really been looking forward to. Our Christmas concert has a lot of great rep on it. And speaking of rep, I am in the rep chair or repiano cornet chair for this concert. It's just temporary because our rep, the one of the only professional players in the band was out for surgery. So I'll be taking his place and hopefully doing him proud in the process. I'm really excited for that. But the first gig of the day is a church service where I have taken the opportunity to play this thing. Now, if I just open it up and show you exactly what we have inside, it is a 1912 Holton New Proportion cornet. It's a real thing of beauty. And, you know, for 110 years old, it plays like an absolute charm. So we're going to be playing one of my very favorite hymns of all time on that solo with piano. And then I'm also in a church ensemble where I'll be playing the trumpet and also a little bit of French horn. So let's get started. Now, obviously I am just gonna take the opportunity to use my double case so I'm not hauling three cases around. So we will displace one cornet in favor of another. Can you tell I really have a big thing about cornets? <laughs> it's like every, every gig I use one, I use a different one. I don't know, they all just have subtly different sounds. We'll make sure to take the mouthpiece because the shank's a little bit of a different fit. So we're not gonna need this cornet mouthpiece as much as I love playing on it. All right. Boom. And then there's this dude. I can't say I perform on French horn terribly much, but I don't have a Con 8D for nothing. I better put it to use.
Fun fact about the Spokane Brass Band, it's a really good ensemble, but it's fairly old overall. When I joined last season, I was by far the youngest person there. Uh, this season, we were running low on cornetists, and I made sure that I wasn't the youngest person. I invited along my friend Tommy, who was a senior in high school and just absolutely killing it. I was really surprised by how well he took to the cornet, especially when I gave him a slightly deeper mouthpiece than what was provided with it. He just immediately adopted a very British sound, kind of what I subscribe to, honestly, and so I was very, very impressed with him. But he also got the job of playing the sleigh bells at this concert. I really enjoyed today. I obviously had that big solo in church on the 110 year old instrument and that I really enjoyed. It was a very humbling and grounding sort of experience. And uh, in the brass band, the Repiano cornet doesn't generally get much solo stuff. I'd say the part is more like kind of a, a second flugel, if you will, or it kind of leads the back row or plays with the soprano or hops in with the front row cornets. But you'll notice the concept is that it never really seems to play solo. And in fact, there's a lot of moments where all of the other cornets except me were playing, which was kind of funny. Um, but nonetheless, it is tradition apparently that in our band on that that jazz piece that we added to our set, that the Repiano player takes the solo. And so I did get in a blues solo by the end of the night. Everybody was incredibly receptive, uh, regardless of what I thought of my own performance, which is another can of worms entirely. But it was, today was a really um, humbling reminder of just how much of a blessing it is to be able to play music for other people, that this is something that I choose to do for fun, but I'm still brought into these fairly serious groups and that people listen to that and they are affected by it is, is something that I personally cannot grasp of my own music, but it is, um, it's truly incredible. Is that, That's all I can really say about it. It's interesting to think that the holiday brass stuff for me is really coming to a head at this point. There's not much left on my plate, uh, especially because brass band was sort of the penultimate thing I had envisioned. And now that that's over, it kind of feels like the home stretch. And I suppose it is. Christmas is approaching and the gigs actually get a little bit more sparse as December wears on just because people are traveling and whatnot. And so they're not exactly looking for brass players necessarily to play Christmas music. But um, in any case, it's a little bit bittersweet. I'll definitely be glad for the pace of my music life to slow down so I can start, you know, making actual content again. I haven't been doing that much as of late, to be honest, besides vlogging my gigs. And so I'll be glad to return to that. But in any case, we have just a little bit more to do. So we'll keep weathering on in the meantime. <laughs> And so we get to Christmas Eve where I finally had that little church service that I rehearsed for right after finals. Today we've got our final gig of the holiday season, which definitely feels a little odd to say, but nonetheless, I've been looking forward to this one. It'll be good to just play with some friends, have a nice casual little church orchestra thing, and then call it a season. This is my last gig of the year as far as I'm concerned, and um, it is going to feel good to be over with, put it that way. I made the impulse decision to once again pull out my Yamaha cornet rather than the brass band's cornet. And, uh, you know, I'm not usually a fan of impulsive decisions like that. I like things to be a little bit more set in stone. But here's the thing with this thing. I mentioned earlier that I thought this would have a brighter sound than a British cornet. 
No, no, this thing sounds a lot darker than a boxed red. So I think it homogenized a little bit better with Jay's flugel playing, and he was also on a Yamaha flugel, and this is a Yamaha cornet. So the intonation patterns, I think, lined up a little bit better than they would have on the Bach, and we were kind of struggling in that first rehearsal because while our tones between my Bach cornet and his Yamaha flugel did seem to homogenize decently, I was having trouble keeping my pitch consistent with his, so <laughs> that was part of the reason for pulling this thing out right before the gig. Um, I, th I think it was a decent choice in the end. I'm, I'm kind of glad I did it, despite, you know, the little confusion it causes. But that's what trumpet players are for, right? Constantly switching horns. Joining us on our gig today are the dynamic duo of vintage Yamahas once more. And I've remembered to pack a stand with me this time so that I'm not constantly breaking my back to switch horns, as I have been doing on a couple gigs due to my own negligence. We'll also make sure we have our mouthpieces with us. As you can see, I've developed a real preference for gold plating as of late. It's a very costly preference, but nonetheless, I think we're ready to go. Frankly, I ought to have given myself a little more time to deal with this. I think the whole country has been facing some rather extreme weather conditions, and uh, this ice is just not really budging right now. Okay, well, it's still a little sketchy. I've got my car heater running in addition to trying to scrape off what I can. But I guess now it's time to hit perilous streets and make the most of the end of the gigging season. Get it like giving season? I made that up all by myself. I'll be here all night.
This was a special gig for me, not particularly for any reasons concerning crazy technical playing or, or an excellent stellar performance or anything of that nature, just because it was a nice, mellow little thing that I was able to do in a small church orchestra, which is a really fulfilling sort of ensemble to play with. I got to see people I hadn't seen in a very long time and play with them and meet with them again, and it was just a really great time overall. This was a really, really great month musically, even if I was constantly busy and stressed and rushing around all over the place, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Even though it's stressful and crazy and nuts, this is what I love doing, and um, while I do need a break from it every once in a while, as I am looking forward to coming soon, it is really fun to just be in all of these different musical experiences and be able to reach out to people with my music. Like I said, it is a privilege to be making music in the shoes that I'm in, despite having chosen a career path that has nothing to do with it. It was also an interesting time for equipment choices, on a lighter note, because, like I said, I have a real problem with cornets and constantly using a different cornet for different purposes, but even just trumpets in general. You know, here's my main trumpet, my Yamaha 8310Z, and my main mouthpiece, my Bach 1.5A, and I've used this setup very consistently for about five years. I didn't touch it once this holiday season. I was instead using my friend's Yamaha 6335, it's a pre-Zeno model, and this Shilke 18, which is a little bit broader, but not quite as deep. Um, the trouble is, I just felt like I homogenized better with trumpet players using this setup, which is such a shame, because I, you know, I miss playing on this one whenever I don't play it for a while. It's one of my easiest playing setups and one of the most fun and nuanced in terms of tone quality. But in the situation I was in, I just kind of blended better on this. Um, and I, I will say, I really, really enjoy playing this horn. It is one of the only that I can say actually holds a candle to my 8310. It's, you know, that good in my eyes. But nonetheless, it's an interesting sort of thing that I did not touch my main horn. Anyway, I should say to my friend Tanner, who actually owns this thing, thank you for letting me use it. It's been a lot of fun. This was his dad's horn way back in the day, so that gives you an idea of the fact that it's quite an old Yamaha. Uh, and it was passed down to Tanner himself, who played it for a few years, but doesn't play at this point. And I initially just wanted to borrow it for a short period of time, back when I was testing a Yamaha Zeno, just to see how a pre-Zeno would stack up to it. And I like this more than the Zeno, frankly. But... Then he went on his mission trip and he just said, you know, why don't you just keep using it? I'm not getting any use out of it. So I really appreciate you letting me use this. I've been putting it to good use and really enjoying it. Anyway, to the about half a dozen or so of you who I imagine are either still here or have skipped to this chapter in the video, thank you for being here in whatever capacity. Your time and support have meant the world. 2022 has been a crazy year for the channel, a great one for sure. We've got a couple more videos to round off the old year and then we're on to some pretty big content starting in 2023. Hope you'll stick around. So if you haven't subscribed, now is the perfect time to do so. A lot of my usual viewers are not subscribed to the channel, and it's the best way to stay up to date with new content as it comes out. Thank you so much for watching this great Gigmas adventure, and until next time, we'll see you on the flip side.